Well, praise God, and it's great to have you back again and uh, celebrating church with us. And uh, hopefully you've actually spent some time in worship as Brenda, Pastor Brenda has led us through worship and communion. And uh, I also want to thank all those who have been giving to our ministry. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for sub- continuing to support us. Uh, if you're still wanting to find a way to do that, you can have a look at the credits at the end. That will take you to our website and you can find out how to give from there. But just really want to thank everybody who's been continuing to support us. Um, I'm going to continue today just on the hot topic of what's going on at the moment. I'm going to address what's going on in the world today as we look behind the noise and behind the panic and the fear and see what God is doing in the midst of all of this. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you are the God of the whole world. We thank you that you are the God of the earth, that nothing that's happening isn't news to you, isn't taking you by surprise, and you've actually talked about it in your word. And so we thank you as we come to your word today that we can actually get strength from your word to actually help us through the days that are upon us. And we thank you for the promises, Lord God, that are in your word that we can hold on to and that we can look to this and we can look to you rather than looking at everything that's going on around us. I pray for everybody who's watching this today, people that have actually been suffering through this, Lord. We just pray for your healing touch. We pray for your provision over their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got a message today and it's called, Has He Got Your Attention Yet? Or Has God Got Your Attention Yet? Yeah, and two weeks ago, uh, last week we had Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday, but two weeks ago I actually spoke on rest for God's people and also rest for the land. And I don't know if you've noticed, but have you noticed how blue the sky is? Uh, last night we noticed how much brighter the stars are. And, you know, for some places around the world, maybe the first time they've even seen blue skies, as at the moment there is rest for the land. And two weeks ago I was talking about, then the buzzword was reset. It's like the world is in this process of reset. And I took the word reset and I removed the second E and you get the word rest. And I said that letter E stands for, you know, earth shattering. This whole crisis has just been earth shattering for everyone and no one is exempt from it. But, you know, people have been very uh, egocentric, you know, when it's come to that, with this sense of entitlement, you know, and I was saying to someone the other day, everyone listens to the same radio station, which is WIIFM, what's in it for me? And so there's this sense of entitlement, what's in it for me? What, 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 uh, yeah, I, I need to look after me. And, you know, as we've evaluated the situation, we've seen there's been a lot of error, a lot of exaggeration, and the fact is we're not going to, the world is not going into extinction, and we believe in a God who is everlasting. And so we looked at, in rest, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Yeah, but the word, the buzzword now seems to be the word unprecedented. Yeah, there's an unprecedented medical situation. Yeah, that we're in a worldwide pandemic and uh, the figures as of Friday that there's over 2 million, been over 2 million cases of COVID-19 resulting in nearly 140,000 deaths. That's worldwide. We're in an unprecedented global research to find a vaccine. And uh, there's a worldwide collaboration in this, none like we've seen before, where um, countries are actually getting their scientists together all over the world to work on getting a vaccine and getting one quickly. But, you know, on Thursday I saw an article that Israel has developed a drug that has a 100% success rate on coronavirus patients who were dying. They've actually tested some already and it's now being tested in the US. And that doesn't surprise me that that's coming out of Israel. Also, we've got unprecedented economic fallout. Uh, the IMF is forecasting that the coronavirus will see the global uh, economy con- contract for by around 3% this calendar year compared to 0.1% contraction during the global financial crisis. 
The great thing for Australia is that we went into this crisis in a position of economic strength and uh, according to our Treasurer and so it's actually set us up well to be able to help provide. Uh, we've, we've seen an unprecedented effect on sport, the Olympic Games being cancelled, the NRL and AFL talking about when they're going to try to you know, resurrect um, this year's season. Uh, unprecedented worldwide war, you know, not hand-to-hand -hand combat, but biological war affecting, in over, affecting over 176 countries. We've seen an um, unprecedented political implications, you know, a national cabinet being formed to, you know, as in war times with extraordinary powers, governments, states and territories all working together, even the opposition and the current government working together to try to bring our country through this. We've seen an unprecedented uncertainty you know, in jobs and uh, rentals, um, you know, people not sure how they're going to be able to pay their rent or pay their mortgage or you know, if they're still going to have their job at the end of this. Um, how, how will they survive when this all comes to an end? And unprecedented, unprecedented restrictions on travel, um, border closures. You know, I never thought I'd see the day when uh, the border would be closed. Just up the road here between New South Wales and Queensland, and um, there, there it is, it's there. And even fines uh, for gathering and the restriction of having to stay at home. So the question is, through all of this in unprecedented times, has God got your attention yet? Yeah, because in Luke 21, verses 25 to 28, and I, I spoke about this a few weeks ago. In this scripture, it says that you know, when they're asking Jesus, the disciples are asking Jesus, what are the signs of the times of your coming? He says, there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth, distress of nations. And when you see sun, moon, and stars, that's talk, talking about earthly leadership, nation, national leadership. And it says there'll be... Um, There'll be distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. Well, now, when you hear of seas and waves, that's typical of um, crowds of people. So, it's, so Jesus was saying there would be uh, perplexity uh, in nations and national leaders and the, the people, uh, they'll, they'll be perplexed. And then it goes on to say in verse 26, men's heart failing them from fear. We're seeing that now. We're seeing that right now men's hearts are failing them because of fear and the expectations of the things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and i love this in verse 27 but then it says then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and this is this is the heart of what jesus says he says in verse 28 now when these things begin to happen which is right where we are right now where things these things begin to happen this is what his encouragement, he says, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Man, what a beautiful promise. And what we can do right at this time, what Jesus is saying to us and said to us in Luke is that when all these things are happening, men, men's hearts are failing them for fear, nations are, are crumbling and, and um, not understanding what is going on and, and working under all these unprecedented times that we talked about a moment ago, the Bible says that we can look up and we can have encouragement. It says lift up your head, which means don't look at what's going on around you. Lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Isn't that wonderful? What a beautiful promise. And so what is God doing in the midst of this? Well, first of all, he's actually bringing redemption and we need to see that. We need to lift our heads and see that God is bringing redemption. So what does that mean? Well, redemption in the Greek actually is the word uh, apolutrosis, I'll say it again, apolutrosis, and it means a releasing effect by payment of ransom. It actually means redemption, deliverance, and liber liberation procured by the pay payment of a ransom. I don't know about you, but I know that people are feeling like... <laughs> Um, there's a ransom at the moment. It's like they're being ransomed. It's like um, they've lost their liberty and lost their freedom. And, um, and so there's a, there's a payment, a redemption, a payment that is releasing us from that. And obviously we know that payment was made by Jesus Christ at the cross. But this word, 
uh, apolutrosis actually has two root words to it. You're going to find this really interesting. The first one is apo, and the second word is lutron. So apolutrosis, apolutron. So the first word, the first root word, apo, means of separation or departing or fleeing, a state of separation that is of distance. Now look at this, this is an interesting word for these times. A physical distance of place or a temporal distance of time. And here, here we are being told that we have to have this physical distancing and this word apo actually means a, a, a distancing. And so what God wants to do is distance us from slavery, from these things. Because the next word, lutron, means the price for redeeming or ransom paid for slaves and captives for the ransom of life and also to liberate many from the misery and the penalty of their sins. And so this word uh, apolutrosis which is the word redemption in the Greek, actually means to separate us from being slave, to separate us from being captive, to separate us from the penalty of sin. So there's twofold. It's a physical thing and also a spiritual thing. And right now, when Jesus said to that, look up for your redemption draws nigh, he wants to separate you from the feeling that right now that you're captive, from the feeling that you're a slave, to this coronavirus, to everything that's going on, you're not a slave to it, you're a slave to Jesus. Amen? And he wants to draw you out from that, both physically and spiritually. So what is God's agenda in all this? He is getting our attention, and the word is redemption. <laughs> Separation, deliverance, and liberty from slavery, captive, and ransom. So let me ask you a question. Under the current situation with what's happening in the world, and all the restrictions, do you feel like a prisoner? Being locked under house arrest, do you feel like a slave to the system, losing your freedoms in this current restrictions? Do you feel like you're being held ransom by the world system? Well, if you do, here's Jesus' answer for you today. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's God's word for today is the word redemption. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because there's something else that is unprecedented that God's, has God's agenda all over it. And it's a convergence between what is happening now and what happened around 1450 BC. You know, back then, the people of God were in lockdown because a plague was passing over the land. Yes, we're talking about the children of Israel when they were in Egypt and, the, and a plague was passing over the land and so they had to go into lockdown every Israelite to their own house. And not only are there orders in Israel now to stay inside their home, but for every nation in this world to stay inside our homes as the virus passes by. You know, we hear about flattening the curve. It's about the virus actually passing by so, and us staying in our homes as it passes by. It's such a, it's such a parallel to what happened back in the Old Testament, but it happened with just the children of Israel and Egypt, which is a type of the world. Now it's actually happening to, in the whole world. Not only uh, Israelites having to stay home, but so are we. You know, and this has never, ever happened in human history. You could say it's unprecedented. And not only that, but we've just celebrated Passover. We've just celebrated Good Friday and Res Resurrection Sunday, which was all instigated as Passover, the same time as now, 3,500 years ago. And so, and then it was fulfilled in Christ Jesus when Jesus was on the cross over 2,000 years ago at Passover. <clears throat> so, for me, that gets my attention, because something that happened so long ago and then was fulfilled on the cross 2,000 years ago is actually very, very significant for what is happening right now. And that often happens in the Bible. What happened um, before happened again and will happen, and it's, it's right there in the Word of God. So what's God's agenda? Because whatever it was then, it's the same now. And so let's go back to the um, Abrahamic covenant, covenant uh, Genesis 15, and verses 13 to 16. 
So if you want to turn to your Bible, if you're um, looking through your Bible or just want to follow um, what I'm saying, Genesis 15, 13 to 16. And this was the promise uh, that God made to Abraham. Remember, he uh, got Abraham to actually set up you know, an altar and um, animals and, uh, and they're going to make a covenant. Normally with a covenant, it's two people making promises and vows, but he put Abraham to sleep. But this is what he said to Abraham. He said, Know certainly, in verse 13, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. Well, we know that happened uh, in, in uh, the promise from Genesis 15 that the, that, uh, the family uh, of Israel went into... Uh, Joseph organized them to come in because there was a famine and they went in but then they ended up being suppressed and was in slavery for 400 years and it's verse 14 it says also the nation whom they serve I will judge afterward they shall come out with great possessions now as for you you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age but in the fourth generation they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete so the, back then, the children of Israel would be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Now, 40 in the Bible means trial and testing, and 10, so 40 times 10, means law, government, and restoration. And so they would go through 10 years of trial and testing, but when they came out of that, they would actually have their own law, they would be their own nation with their own government, and they would be restored as a nation. Amen. And then we come forward into Exodus as to when um, this is actually going to take place. And Moses has an encounter with Jesus, the angel of the Lord at the burning bush. And we read this in Exodus 3, 6 to 12. It said, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. Remember, you can replace Egypt with the word the world. And have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now listen to this. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, and to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites. Amen. So Jesus is saying he has come down to deliver you out of the world and to bring you to a place that is flowing with milk and honey. But guess what? He said the same thing to Abraham and when he got there, it was a wilderness, there was a famine and he didn't trust in God for his provision and we're going to look at that in a moment. But coming out of the world to actually re to, um, rely on the provision and the protection of God may look like a wilderness. God is, does that. Even the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt. They were slaves, but they were reliant on the world. They were reliant on Egypt for their provision and their protection. Now they were, they were going into the wilderness and having to trust in God. They didn't go into a, uh, a beautiful place. They didn't go into the, um, this place flowing with milk and honey straight away. But God took them in there so that they would trust him for his provision. And it says, I'm taking to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pe Pezites, and the Hivites, and the Jezebites. And now therefore, behold, the cry of Israel has come to me, children of Israel, and I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, I will certainly be with you. This shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Israel, you shall serve God on this mountain. You know, and I believe that's part of God's agenda still today, that he wants to bring his people out of the world, out of reliance on the world, out of slavery to the world, and to a place where... He is providing for us and we are serving him. Amen? And he is actually our provision and our provider. So when God redeemed them, there was a physical release from slavery and instigated at Passover, but it's also a picture of salvation coming out of the world and out of slavery to sin. That word again, 
uh, apolytrosis, <laughs> meaning both a separation from slavery and captivity, but also being separated from sin. So God used the plague for redemption. Now, I'm not saying that God created the coronavirus. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that God works all things together for good. And I believe that he's using this to actually bring redemption for his people, to bring them out of slavery, to bring them out of the world, and to actually bring them back to a place of relying on God. And so he used this plague for redemption, and when they came out, three million of them, scholars say that at the time, is the nation of Israel was about three million, three million of them were there, and there was a massive salvation, a massive deliverance, and a massive healing of a nation, all in one day. And now they would come out of Egypt, out of the world, and rely on God for his provision and protection. Now remember this also happened with Abraham. <laughs> he had to stop relying on the world for his provision and protection and trust in God. And he did that through believing in the God of the resurrection. You see that in my message on uh, Resurrection Sunday. So in one day, God resurrected, resurrected a nation out of slavery, provided for them for 80 years in the wilderness, and brought them into the promised land and brought them into rest. So I believe this is happening again right now. It's time for the people of God to stop looking to Egypt, stop looking to the world, let God redeem you from this world, from slavery, ransom and captivity, and trust in him for your provision and protection. You know, when Moses said those famous words from God, let my people go, he said it nine times. And the number nine in the Bible is completeness, finality and fullness and when Jesus died on the cross he released he said let my he let his people go he let the people get, um, be released from sin released from slavery and he said it is finished it is complete it is final it, it is fully done and so Jesus wants you to be free from the world not from just from slavery but from the, the world and its hold on your life. Amen. And you know, when, when Moses said those famous words from God, let my people go, it's only the first time when he said that, let them go that they may hold a feast. And, in, and you'll see this in Exodus 5.1. It says, afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Out of all the times that he said it nine times, there's only one time when he said that they may go and hold a feast for me in the wilderness. And that word feast in the Hebrew means worship, celebration, dancing, um, a holy day, and to make a pil pilgrimage. Amen. And I believe in this, God is saying, you know, he wants his people to be let go of the world, to come into him, into this place of worship, to find that place of worship again, to celebrate, to dance, you know, and celebrate the Lord and to uh, make a pilgrimage back to him. But it says, hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And you know, that word wilderness in the Hebrew means desert or pasture. So it can actually mean desert or pasture. And we know that they actually went into the desert, but eventually they came into a place of pasture. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's scary just to uh, say, God, I'm relying on you. You know, at the moment, we can't rely on the world too much. A lot of what the world system has given us is falling but, and, and is crashing. But, you know, we can rely on God. We can trust in him. And we can trust him in the wilderness. At the moment, you may feel like you're in a wilderness and, and uh, you can't rely on the world anymore, but you can rely on God in the wilderness. I'm not saying the wilderness will go away. Um, the children of Israel went out of the world into the wilderness, but God provided for them every day manna and bread, you know, from, from heaven and water from the rock. He didn't take them straight into the promised land. In fact, um, they would have gone there, but they had to go through the wilderness to get into the promised land. And... I'm not saying that God will take you straight from where you are to the promised land. He may do. 
But, you know, what he wants to do is in the middle of your wilderness, let him be the one that you turn to for your provision and protection and let him be the one who actually provides for you in the midst of the wilderness. And then it will actually become a place of pasture. So what is God saying? It's a time to come out and rely of relying on the world, make a pilgrimage back to him, to true worship, to dancing and celebration in the wilderness, and he will lead us to green pastures that he talks about in Psalm 23. You know, the children of Israel had to make a major shift from relying on the world, even though they were in slavery, and to relying on God to provide from them supernaturally. And... Um, Relying on God instead of the world can be a wilderness experience, but God will provide in the midst of the wilderness, as I said before. And it's also about a return to the heart of worship. You know, uh, uh, there was a song written, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And uh, the pastor at the time, his music group, they'd lost that worship. It all became about the performance. It all became about the musicianship. And, and so he came in one day, he said, you've lost the heart of worship. He said, we're going to worship without any instruments, just back to the basics. And out of that came, uh, it was a pastor called Mike Pivolacci. And out of that, the song was written, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And you know, um, just like, you know, uh, as that song says, when the music strips away and uh, and it all fades, you know, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's like everything is stripped away at the moment. I was uh, watching uh, one of Jensen Franklin's uh, messages and, and uh, for worship, they just had uh, four people. It was Matt Redman, it was a, a lady, a guy on a piano and a guy on a keyboard, and it was stripped right back. No lights, nothing on the screen, just four of these guys just worshiping God. And it was beautiful, it was very intimate, and it's like, Um, Because of what's happened with this um, coronavirus and because everything's been stripped back, it's allowing us to come back to the heart of worship, come back to that, you know, worship which is just intimate between us and God and with all, you know, the noise and everything that goes on. And so um, God is saying, you know, that's why he said, I want them to be released, let my people go so they may hold a feast to me. And we know that ended up being seven feasts, but it started with the feast of Passover, which we have just celebrated. That's why I love this convergence about everything that's happening now and everything that happened then. But you know, we just read Exodus, Exodus 5.1, but look at Exodus 5.2. It says, look at the response from the world or the king of the world at the time. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey? His voice to let Israel go. I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And you know, just before uh, they went into, out of Egypt, there were, before all this happened, there was this rise in anti-Semitism. There was this rise that, uh, you know, this whole thing about, you know, the Jews were there, they were working, they were, they were in their area, but because God had given them so much favour, they were growing and they felt fear, the world, Egypt, and, and um, pressure. So what they did is they then enslaved them. And so they became very anti towards this group who it was fine before. It said they, uh, Pharaoh came who didn't know Joseph, and so there was a rise of anti-Semitism. And, you know, just before this current crisis, there has been a rise in anti-Christianity. And uh, we saw that happening, you know, uh, just, just all around us and that Christianity has become the most um, persecuted religion in the world. And so there was this rise towards this just before all this happened. And isn't it amazing, just before Passover and just before the children of God were released, there was a rise in anti-Semitism. Just before this has happened, our current crisis, there was definitely a rise of anti-Christianity. And what, out of that rise of anti-Semitism, God released them out of the world and brought them into a place of looking to him for protection and provision. And I believe the same is happening now. There's, there was a rise of anti-Christianity, and now God is actually calling his people back to himself, back to worship, back to him being their provider and their, his, their protection. Amen? So has he got your attention yet? Has God got your attention yet? Because, you know, God's agenda for redemption, I believe, is twofold. 
First of all, to bring his people out of relying on the world, back to total reliance on him. But secondly, to bring about a revival of deliverance and salvation for the world. Remember, in one day, three million people saved, healed and delivered. And as we look at God's agenda in Exodus 6, we're going to see the Great Commission and what he's doing today all converging together in his plan of redemption. Amen? So he had a plan of redemption for the children of Israel. He had a plan of redemption in Jesus Christ to redeem the world. And I believe God is actually has a plan of redemption right now because he said right back in Luke, when you see these things coming, when you see these things beginning to happen, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Amen. So our redemption is drawing near. The world was redeemed when Jesus Christ died on the cross and then the Israelites were redeemed when they came out. All those three things converging together for such a time as this. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. So let's have a look at Exodus chapter 6 and verses 6 to 7. And it says this, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from the burdens of Egypt. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will bring and I will be your God. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so that is that is the great commission right there my friends. That was the great commission back then and then Jesus gave the great commission and then we're seeing it again today. We're part of the great commission. And when the uh, Israelites do Passover, they celebrate four cups, and it's according to the scripture that I just wrote out then. Uh, the first cup is the cup of sanctification, which is part of the scripture where it says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And remember uh, that word redemption, uh, apolotosis, actually means a separation and sanctification means a separation i will separate you from egypt i will bring you out from the world that's the first cup the second cup is the cup of deli deliverance which is i will re rescue you from their bondage so not only am i bringing you out of the world i'm bringing you out of the slavery that the world has actually put upon you and then the third cup, this is interesting because the third cup is the one that we use typically when we have communion every Sunday. And if you've just celebrated communion uh, with worship, with Brenda, with worship and did communion, the cup that you used was what Jesus used as the third cup and it's called the cup of redemption and judgment. And it, it's the, verse, the part of the verse in, in uh, verse 6 where it says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. And for the children of Israel, the judgment was upon the world. The judgment was upon the Egyptians or anyone who didn't have the blood on their doorposts. But for Jesus, he actually took all the judgment. Amen? He took all that judgment upon himself. So God is not judging now. We are not judged by God because Jesus took it at the cross. Amen? But the way is open for us to come, come in to receive everything that God has for us. Even Jesus said in John 3.16 that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But in verse 17, he said, I didn't come into the world to condemn or to judge the world, but that through me the world might be saved. And so there's a, another chance for this great salvation. You know, it happened back then. It happened it, it, when Jesus died on the cross, and it's happening right now. The Great Commission, these words are still so clear as, as they were then. The Great Commission is still so clear as it was then. It's time, friends, to see people come into the kingdom of God. We can, you know, it happened. Three million people got saved in one day back in Exodus. It can happen again, even greater now. Amen? And then the fourth cup was a cup of praise or restoration. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. God wants his people to actually come to him so that he can be their God, he can be their father, so that he can provide for you, that he can protect you. And in the cup of praise is about worship, is about coming back to that place of worship.
So 3,500 years ago, God redeemed his people through the blood of the lamb, protected them from the plague that was going through the world, and then brought them out of the world to worship him and become their provision and protection. And he's doing the same today, reaching out to you and uh, reaching, reaching out to bring to you salvation and redemption. Now, I just want to finish on this scripture. After the children of Israel celebrated the Passover and then left Egypt, there were some significant things that took place. And these are all fulfilled in Christ. And I want, to see, want you to see this in Psalm because as you look to the Lord for your provision and protection, these are the things you're actually going to find because this is what happened for them. And let's go to Psalm 105 and verse 37. So there's a commentary here about what happened. Uh, from verse 26, it's talking about the plagues and um, the darkness and the, the, the waters that were turned to blood and all that sort of thing. And then uh, in 36, it says, He destroyed all the firstborn in the land and the first of all their strength. Now, verse 37. Look at all the promises of God when you, when you um, walk away from the world and walk into God and look to him. First of all, it says, he brought, them out of, he brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Now, here's an interesting one. When they left, they actually left with silver and gold from the world. Amen? So you may still get some provision from the world, but it actually will be what God has actually provided through them. That's the difference. It's one thing to rely on the world. It's another thing to rely on God and for God to use the world to actually give you his provision. And that's what happened for them because that was supernatural. They left. They were leaving. The Egyptians didn't want them to go. The king didn't want them to go. But when he did, they did go, they gave them. People gave them gold and silver as they left. And so God will use different things to provide for you. And uh, he may use the world to provide for you, but it will be his provision, not the world's provision. Amen. And so, so he can provide for you financial provision from the world. Uh, verse, that was verse 37. Um, also, it says there was none feeble among his tribes. And so he provided healing. You know, out of three million people, not one of them was sick. And you, you imagine, they were slaves. They were working hard. They were whipped. Um, they were oppressed. And yet when they left, when they left out of the world into God, he actually protected them and healed every single one of them. And so we can look to God for his healing. We can look to God for that promise as we are pressing into him. And uh, verse 38, it says, Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. Amen. That's the fear of God. It wasn't so much the fear of the people. It was the fear of God because of what he'd done and how he displayed those signs and wonders. And the fear of God came upon them. Amen. And I believe that through this, you know, um, there's some amazing things that's happening. One of them is that, yes, we've seen the whole empty shelves of toilet paper, but I've seen bookshops with empty shelves of Bibles, um, people reaching out, asking for prayer, reaching out to God from the world because of what's going on. And so there's an amazing opportunity for us to bring Jesus in the midst of this. Um, verse 39 says, He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. Amen. That's his protection and his guidance. He would guide them. They would, um, when the, the pillar and the fire would go, they would actually follow. So he would guide them through the wilderness, but he would actually protect them as well. Amen. And so you're going into the protection and guidance of the Lord. And, you know, we need the guidance of the Lord now more than ever because there's this unknown about what's happening. You know, there's this uncertainty, unprecedented, as I said before, uncertainty as to have I lost my job? Will I get my job back? Will I be able to stay where I live? All this uncertainty. But, you know, God has said, I will be with you and I will never forsake you and I will never leave you. So our certainty is in him. Amen. And verse 40 says, the people asked and he brought quail and he satisfied them with bread from heaven. And you know, that's a supernatural provision. And I believe that as you press into God, he will, he will provide a supernatural provision because you'll be pressing into God. You may still be in the wilderness, 
but you'll be pressing into God and he will supply and he will provide for you. It happened for the children of Israel. It'll happen for you. And he said, and he opened the rock and water gushed out and it ran into the dry places like a river. And so um, water and bread are the main two things that sustain us and God will sustain you through this time as you look to him. And then in verse 42 it said, he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant and he brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles and they inherited the labour of the nations that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise the Lord. So he fulfilled his promise and they went out of the world into God's provision with joy. You know, I really um, hope that speaks to you. And, and today, if you're watching this, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, and you're looking at what's going on and you're just saying, I just don't know, this is so unprecedented and I just don't know what's going to happen. You know, God is a solid rock and God wants to, he loves you, he wants to provide for you, he wants to call you his child and he wants to be there for you as a loving father. And, you know, he did everything at the cross. All this talks around the cross because it's salvation and deliverance out of the world, deliverance from sin and slavery to the world. And he just wants to provide for you. And ultimately, we'll be going to a place flowing with milk and honey. You know, the promised land we can have now, but one day we know our destination is to be with Jesus, to be with God in an amazing place. And if never, you've never made that decision, I want to give you that opportunity today. And I simply want you just to do it this way, just to ask Jesus Christ to come in and be your Lord and Saviour. Because he's done it all, he's done it all for you. And he's not judging you, he's actually making a way for you to be saved. And so I'm just going to pray a prayer. And if you can repeat it after me, uh, then if you, the Bible says if you believe in your heart, if you say with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And so let me just ask you right now to follow, just in the uh, comfort of your own room, just to um, repeat this prayer after me. And if you believe it with your heart that Jesus Christ is your saviour, then the Bible says you're saved. So just um, repeat after me. Dear Lord, I thank you for dying for me. I thank you that you did what you, everything that you could to save me, that you want to deliver me that you want to embrace me as a child. I'm sorry for not following you. I'm sorry for going my own way and doing my own thing. But today, I want to come out of my reliance on the world and I want to rely on you. I want to have you as my Lord and Saviour. I want you to be my Father, my protector and my provider. And so I just ask for your forgiveness. I turn to you today and I accept you as my Lord and Saviour. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, then that means that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. And I just encourage you to get around, if you know some Christians, to get around them, let them know what you've done, and uh, that you've asked Jesus Christ into your life. Uh, or you're free to contact us uh, through our website. The details will come up for you shortly. But God bless you. It's been great to uh, have church with you again. And, uh, and uh, I'm just so excited about what God is doing. Um, share this message. Let people know about this message to encourage them through what we're going through now. There are, we are in unprecedented times, but God is doing some unprecedented things and it all con converging together. And as Jesus said, in the midst of everything that's going up, going on, look up for your redemption towards nigh. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye.